It is indeed our prayer that the Lord would breathe on his people in power, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out in abundance in all the family of God, and that those who are today wandering from the sheepfold would be brought back to the good shepherd. That is Jesus' desire. It always has been. That is the Father's desire. It always has been. And that is at the heart of the words which our Lord Jesus speaks to us this morning. We're going to be examining another one of Jesus' great I am statements. Seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says of himself, I am. Last week, I am the bread of life. Today, I am the door. If you have your Bibles with you, would you please turn in them to the Gospel of John, chapter 10, beginning at verse 7. Listen now to these powerful words of our Lord Jesus. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Aren't those powerful words? I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That is the Lord Jesus' desire that you and I and every other human being on the face of this planet experience abundant life in Him. It is such a powerful phrase. It is the desire of every human heart to experience life in all of its fullness. And it is what Jesus offers, and he offers it freely. But let's be very honest. Some of his words do not play well in American culture today, and do not play well in our society. Jesus said, I am the door. Please note he didn't say, I am one of the doors. He didn't say, I'm one of a multitude of doors. He didn't say, pick your own door. He said, I am the door, the one and the only. I am the door. All who enter by me, he says, will be saved. On the one hand, those words are beautiful and powerful. On the other hand, they are shocking to a culture that says it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. On the one hand, the, the thought of abundant life is appealing. On the other, our culture says, oh, you know, there are many ways to life. But Jesus makes it very clear. One way. And this morning, we need to listen to his word, both for ourselves and for those we love, both for our own relationship with Him and for the desire of our hearts that others, including members of our family, our circle of friends, our co-workers, our fellow students, that they come to know Him, who is the door. Today in our culture, there are many who have been blinded by an attitude which simply says it doesn't really matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you do. Just live life to the fullest and that's all there is. We're witnessing a change in our culture that is absolutely astonishing to behold. In fact, I'd like to share with you some statistics that were uh, put out just a few years ago by the George Barna organization. For those of you who are not familiar with George Barna, he's a former political activist and pollster who became a follower of Jesus. It changed his life. And he today uses all of the skills that he had as a political consultant to examine what's going on in our culture and to allow followers of Jesus to know what's happening around us and how can we best reach a culture that is changing very rapidly. One of the things that Barna and his associates have discovered is that in American culture today, very few people actually adhere to what you would call a, a biblical worldview. 
We've adopted a worldview that, that frankly is self-generated and self-made, that ignores what God has revealed and just simply kind of goes with whatever happens to be popular. It's widely held. But do you know that in America today, at least at the last polling, only 9% of Americans hold to a biblical understanding of things. Now, if you're wondering, well, what is the biblical understanding they're talking about? Here's the way George Barna defines a biblical worldview. I'd like to read it to you here real quickly. He says, for the, perspective, for the purposes of this survey, a biblical worldview was defined as believing that absolute moral truth exists, that the Bible is totally accurate in all of its principles that it teaches, that Satan is considered to be a real being or force, not merely symbolic, that a person cannot earn their way to heaven by trying to be good or do good works, that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on earth, and that God is the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the world who still rules the universe today. In the research, anyone who held all of these beliefs was said to have a biblical worldview. It's a pretty brief and uh, actually a, a nice summary of the fundamentals of biblical teaching. It is the worldview that has been held by Orthodox Christian believers throughout the centuries. But in America today, only 9% of us hold to that kind of a worldview. If you're saying, well, at least it's better in the church, isn't it? Not by much. That same study discovered the following, that among people who declare that they have a faith relationship with Jesus Christ and believe in him with all their heart, that they've committed their lives to him, 19% of them hold to a biblical worldview when you examine them a little bit closer. And what it shows is what is obvious to so many of us as we simply go about our daily lives. We are living in a culture that basically has chosen to ignore God. But praise God, he has not chosen to ignore us. And, and that's why these words of Jesus speak with such incredible power to our hearts and lives. I am the door, Jesus said. I am the door. I am the way to salvation. I am the way to the living God. I am the way to the Father. And when we see Jesus, we see the incredible love of God. You know, to understand that the creator of the universe would care for us so much that he would actually be willing somehow, some way beyond our ability to fully comprehend it, that he would be willing to take on human flesh, that he would actually walk among us, that he would show us his incredible mercy and grace. When you look at Jesus, you cannot help but see the mercy of the Heavenly Father. Anyone who finds himself or herself wondering, does God really care? Does God really know what I'm going through? All you have to do is look at Jesus and look at what we see of him in the scriptures and you realize how deep the Father's love is for each and every one of us. The Lord Jesus, he destroys the lie that God does not care because he shows us that God came among us that he loves us, and that he offers us life and hope no matter what may be going on in our own day, in our own lives, in our own homes, in our own businesses. Whatever may be happening, there is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is at the heart of what he says, I am the door. In our culture, that sounds exclusive, but I would remind you that God has always been exclusive. God has always said, there is truth and there is a lie. The enemy is the liar. And Jesus says, he comes to kill and to destroy. But Jesus has come that we may have life and have it abundantly. That's what he says in John chapter 10. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And you know, in your very soul, abundant life is what we all crave. Abundant life means knowing that my life has purpose because God is watching over me. 
Abundant life means that no matter what may have been done to me, no matter what may have gone on in my life, no matter how I may have stumbled, there is a God who loves me so much that he actually came down. And that in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, the living God, not only lived the perfect life I could not live, but he died the death I deserve to die. He paid the hell I deserve to suffer. And he offers now by his death and resurrection forgiveness and hope to everyone who believes. Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. And everyone who comes to me will be saved. And I will allow my sheep to go in and out to pasture. In other words, I'm going to feed them. I'm going to feed their very souls. I'm going to speak to the deepest needs of their hearts. I'm going to minister to their grief and to their sorrow. And I'm going to fill them with joy as they walk with me. That is the life that Jesus offers. And it's not just for today, it's forever. And it doesn't mean that simply things can get better. It means that the best is yet to come. And the Lord Jesus says to you and to me, I am the door. You don't want to miss the only way to the Father. You do not want to miss the only way of life. I think of the generation of Noah's day. I wonder what percent of them had a biblical worldview. A uh, little lower than in America, but not a whole lot lower. And only one family was saved. As Noah was instructed to build an ark to save him and his family, to save animal life and to save any who wanted to come in. There was only one door in the boat. One door in that massive ship. Now, you know what OSHA would have done. You know, they, 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 would, have, uh, they would have condemned that vessel before it ever floated away. You know, one door, you've got to be kidding but God's architecture is different than human architecture. And God knows there is truth and everything else is a lie. And there is one way and one door and one way in. And Jesus says, I am that door. And what he does is he comes to you and to me and he says, are you willing to come through the door? I think to the words of Revelation where Jesus in speaking to the churches ministers to each of them in a very unique way. But to one, one that has wandered far from a biblical worldview, he says to them, I stand at the door and knock. You see, he's outside the door of the church because so often the church has wandered from him. And he knocks and he says, I am the door. He says, Hear me, listen to my voice, and watch what I can do in your life. Things may be going really well for you, but you need the door. And things may be falling apart so fast, it's making your head swim, but you need the door. Jesus says, I am the door. I came across a story recently that illustrates that so well. It's a story that dates back to the early 1900s. One of the greatest preachers in the world at that time, a fellow by the name of G. Campbell Morgan, had a book passage on an uh, ocean liner heading over to the UK. He found himself on board with one of the greatest Old Testament scholars of the day. And as they talked, this man shared with Morgan something he had experienced in his travels in the Middle East. He had gone into the area around Syria and found himself confronting a shepherd who was watching over his sheep in the sheepfold. They began to converse with one another. The shepherd was not a follower of Jesus. He was a Muslim man. And uh, as the two of them talked, this brilliant Old Testament professor commented on the fact, so this is the sheepfold, huh? That was a brilliant deduction four walls, a door going in, and uh, inside a bunch of sheep. The shepherd says, yep, when the sheep are in here, I protect them. This is where they spend the night. And with that, this brilliant Old Testament scholar looked at the shepherd and said, well, I, I see an entrance, but I don't see a door. And with that, the shepherd looked at him and said, 
I am the door. When the sheep go into the sheepfold at night, I am the door. Not one of them gets away without walking over me. And not a single wolf gets in except over my body. I am the door. Jesus says, I am the door. I know how to protect my own. I care for my own. He says to you and to me, I will defend you. I am your sure defense, your shield. I am your solid rock. I am your hope and your sure defense. I am the door. Whoever comes in through me will be saved. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that is his desire for you and for me and for all of our friends and neighbors and relatives, for the strangers who come into our lives, for the enemies in our lives. God's desire is that all come to know him. And it's at that point that I'd like to share with you some reflection on these words in lieu of what is going on in our country today. Because I believe that what I'm going to share with you has great significance for what God is calling us to do to wake us now. We are not what you would call a typical or traditional church. And the Lord has made it very clear how we are to proceed. In a world that is so preoccupied with buildings, he calls us to be concerned with people. In a world that is so concerned about merely chattering with one another, he calls us to share with everyone the mighty things that he has done. We are living today at a time when things are changing so rapidly, it is difficult for any of us to comprehend what is going on and how quickly things are changing. But I'd like to share with you some statistics and some studies that have just recently been published. And by recently, I mean within the last several months, October of 2014 to be exact. What we have discovered as researchers have looked at the views and attitudes of Americans today, what we're discovering is that things are changing so quickly very few people even realize the magnitude of the change. Let me illustrate that. 20 years ago, 20 years ago, about 20%, two out of every 10 Americans, were not affiliated with any Christian church. 20%. 10 years ago, about a third of Americans, 33%, were not affiliated with any Christian church body. So in 10 years, it went from 20% unchurched to 33% unchurched. Today, that number is approaching 50%. And today, one third of all American adults maintain that they once attended a church and used to believe, but they don't go anymore. It is happening so quickly and so fast that it is difficult to keep up with the massive change and the quick spread of, if not unbelief, at least disconnectedness in America. Many individuals of the one-third of American adults who say they used to belong to a church, freely admit that they think there probably is a God, but they've been so turned off by organized religion. Many of them cite things like it's just a club, and it's no different from any other organization. And I'm embarrassed and ashamed to admit they're right in oh so many instances. Because so often, what has happened in our culture today is that we have basically treated God like dirt. We give him lip service, but we treat him as a God who doesn't really exist, and if he does, then he doesn't really know what's going on. And we go about life as usual, and our lives are falling apart. 
And we wonder, why aren't people attracted to that? It is a far cry from biblical faith. Biblical faith is dynamic. It is exciting. Now, it's not easy. And it can be very, very painful because when God's people really live as God's people, the enemy puts, pulls, pushes back. It's what Jesus said. The, the enemy, the adversary, he's a liar. He's a murderer. And, and he does everything he can to keep the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ away from people who need what only the Lord Jesus can give. And today, many people have simply walked away from religion but they haven't necessarily walked away from the Lord Jesus and from the living God. And today there are many people who have been turned off by organized Christianity, but who are open to real, genuine, spirit-filled Christian truth. And that is what the Lord our God is calling us to do. To use media that has only recently become available and to reach a generation of people who today are wired into everything. Wi-Fi is everywhere. Who may never set foot in a church, but who will check something out and listen to the truth. And I believe that is why God has called us to do what he's called us to do. It's because Jesus always has been the door. And because in every day and in every age, he raises up his people to do what he has called us to do all along, to make disciples of the nations, to call people back to the truth, and to hold out hope in a world that is so often hopeless. Today there are many people who look at what's going on in our country and they simply throw up their hands in despair and say, oh, we're going to hell in a handbasket. But I would remind you that the God who did not hesitate to step into our world is a God who changed our world. And I would remind you that in a single generation, he took a small group of people and used them to bring good news to people throughout the nations. He is still doing that. He is still God. And he calls us not to despair. He calls us not to throw up our hands in disgust. He calls us not to turn our back on a dying world and say, well, they're getting what they deserve. He calls us instead to listen to what he says. I am the door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. That is his heart's desire. And what God desires, God gets. What God yearns for and longs for, God provides. What God calls his people to do, God then also brings the power, the authority, and the resources to accomplish what he has said will be done. And it's in that that we move forward. We recognize we are living in dangerous times. We understand that in the last days, it's going to be just like this because the Bible says we've been in the last days since the Lord Jesus came, suffered, died, and rose. And if you say, well, when do you predict it's all going to come to an end? I don't have a clue. I just know it's 2,000 years closer than it was when Jesus said, make disciples of all the nations. And so he calls us to do what he's told us to do. If you continue in my word, he says, you're truly my disciples. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set them free. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And he summons you and me to share. To share not only with example in our lives, to share not only by talking to others about the Lord and witnessing to him, but also to share with others using everything from our email accounts to Facebook, whatever the case may be, to proclaim the glorious name of the Lord, to call people who are turned off by religion to be turned on by the power of the divine word, by the transforming power of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
by the resurrection power of the living God, and by the outpouring of the spirit of holiness on all who believe. Our God is an awesome and mighty God. And he calls us to simply follow him as he does awesome and mighty things. We pray, awake us now. We live by faith. And we trust the God who has always delivered on his promises. And so we do not despair. We do not look at a world in disgust. We instead hold up before the living God the needs of people around us. Our brothers and sisters in the faith are being persecuted around the world and those who do not yet know him. We even pray for our enemies. And we pray not, Lord, sick them, but rather we pray, Lord, change them. Move in the hearts of people today, O oh Lord, to call them back to you. We pray for those who have wandered away from religion but need to come back to the fold of the living God. We pray for those who are turned off by the same old, same old. And we pray that they might experience the renewing power of the spirit of the living God. And that is what our Lord Jesus calls us to do until he returns. To testify to him, to bear witness to his name, to summon friends and neighbors, family, and the nations to him who is the light of the world. But that's for another week. Next week, I am the light of the world. Today, he's the door. And he will be tomorrow. And he'll even be the door next week when we talk about the light of the world. But we will walk in him and allow him to feed us, to lead us to pasture, and to carry out everything he has called us to do. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Oh, Lord our God, how we honor and bless your holy name. We are in awe of you, Lord. You are so good and gracious. You minister to the deepest needs of our lives. Oh, Lord, today, any of us who have wandered from you or have doubted you or who have gotten outside the sheepfold, we thank you that you are standing at the door with arms stretched wide open to receive us. And we say, oh Lord, we give ourselves to you. We pray this day for our friends, for members of our family, for people who are dear to us but who are wandering far from you. Oh Lord, we pray that you would intervene in their lives. We thank you that you love them even more than we do. And so we pray, Father, that you would woo them back to yourself, that you would call them to you, and that you would transform their lives as they get a glimpse of Jesus who is the door, the one through whom we are saved. We pray, Lord, for our enemies. We pray that in this time of terror and violence, of international turmoil, and of unspeakable evil, that you would continue to appear to those around the world who are at present estranged from you and that you would show them your goodness and your mercy. We pray that the testimony of fellow believers in Jesus would be so powerful that it would speak even to those who have given themselves over to hatred and death and evil and would remind them that the living God is a God who brings life, not death, and a God who offers hope, not fear. So, Father, we pray in our day that you continue to do in a mighty way what you have always done, calling the nations back to you. And we pray, Lord, that you would use us and use each of us in a way that would draw others to yourself. Be glorified here, in the days to come, in all things. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.